lots and lots of wood. They shipped all their timber down to San Francisco. But Seattle had a few problems. They were at sea level. So when there was high tide, the Punch of Sound would come over and the roads would get washed out. Well, the roads would get washed out. Matter of fact, there was one pothole that they swore was so deep that someone actually drowned in it, a little kid. <laughs> now imagine they have these houses on a very steep hill. Plumbing wasn't so great back then. So what they did was, if you were up at this house up here, and you flushed the toilet, and it was high tide, well, let's picture this, if you would. You flush, high tide, two forces of water are meeting. And if you happen to be that poor soul in the bathroom over here, it's a very unpleasant day. Let's just say that. <laughs> so June 6, 1889, John Beth worked for Victor Claymore in his woodworking shop. And John went over and he had this big square piece of glue. And the glue was made from animal fat at that time. He chopped off his piece and he went over to this big black cauldron with a nice fire going and he threw the glue into the fire because he needed to melt it. John looked away. And before you know it, there's a spark of fire. And John looked at that fire and he said, oh my goodness, I've got to take care of this because this is a timber town. And you can just imagine what a fire would do to a timber town. So, on this horse fat, or grease, he took water. Anybody that knows anything about water and grease, it doesn't work. And he threw that water on that grease fire and it just flew up in his face. And all of a sudden, the turpentine and the wood chips and all the timber was just a flame. John got out of there. At 2.45, 30 minutes later, the fire department came. The smoke was so bad they couldn't even find the source of the fire. Well, the fire kind of jumped from building to building, and eventually from block to block. And it actually went up to the homes. It went one after another after another. By 3 a.m., the fire was finally burning out. By 4 a.m., they knew they were doomed. Next morning, June 7, 1889, Robert, Mayor Robert Moran, called a town meeting. It was an open forum. They had no building yet. So Robert went up and he said, we're going to rebuild. And now we have thousands of people that have no job, 600 businessmen who have no business, a million dead rats around the place, and they're all looking at him like, what? We are going to rebuild. And our homes and our businesses are going to be better because they're going to be made of brick and concrete and mortar, and it's only 20% of timber. And we're going to buy these homes here, and we're going to move the residents back, because what we're going to do is we're going to sluice the mountain. Now, sluicing the mountain is an interesting concept, because what you're going to do is you're going to take water hoses, you're going to put them up at the mountain up here, and the dirt is going to naturally come down. So back to Robert. We're going to sluice the mountain, and we're going to build the roads up to 12 feet. No more of this washout when we have high tide. And the businessmen looked at Robert and they said, Robert, we love this idea. How long will this take? And Robert said, 12 years. And said, we're going to San Francisco. <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We can do this. We can do this. So here's what we'll do. Is we're going to rebuild our town. But know all you businessmen that our town is actually going to be at the second level. So we'll start at that first level, and eventually we'll start building up the roads. And as we build the roads, step by step, we'll build a higher retaining wall. So imagine, you have a building, you have a sidewalk, you have a retaining wall, a road, retaining wall, sidewalk, building. Very simple businessmen thought of it and they said, okay, we can do this. So they built. And knowing that they were going to have their bottom floor was eventually not going to be their main floor, they didn't put a lot of work into how it was going to look because the second floor was going to be their primary. Well, back in 1889, if you can kind of imagine women with their big skirts 
There was no problem in the beginning when it was one foot. You know, you just climb over here, walk across the street, just climb over, get to the other side. Well, a few years later, when it's six feet, seven feet, <laughs> eight feet, you're walking down. If you want to get to the other side, you have to find that ladder. You climb up the ladder, you cross the street, you climb down the ladder, and you go. Well, if you're a woman with those big skirts, it was not a pleasant time to be in Seattle, 1889. This worked wonderful. And finally, they had it so that the road was 12 feet high, and they're going to close off the sidewalk. So they put big steel I-beams, and they closed the sidewalk. But some people still liked shopping and doing their work down at the bottom level. So they went ahead and they put glass in the sidewalk, which eventually you can see that they turned to amethyst because the sunlight connected with the magnesium. People would walk under the underground, they would still shop, but now your second story became your primary floor. And in 1907, because of fear of the bubonic plague, they finally closed the first floor. But today, you can go to Pioneer Square and take a tour of the underground world of Seattle and see what it looked like back in 1889.